Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today during what we know is a challenging time for all of us. I'm Beth Stroll with the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health, and I co-facilitate this System of Care Leadership Learning Community together with my colleague, Denise Bilsbeck, and we would like to welcome you to this month's session. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that we're all now in a world where responding to COVID-19 is our top priority. Uh, we recognize and appreciate that this is a difficult time for all of us in children's services across the country, and of course, especially for the children and families that we serve. Uh, since you're all involved in responding in your states and communities, we at the TA Network want to make sure that we're supporting you and supporting your efforts around COVID-19 uh, in every way possible. Uh, we've created an initiative that we're calling Managing Now for a Better Tomorrow uh, to accomplish this. And we're focusing both on what we can do now and also to create solutions as we move forward into new phases. Uh, we hosted a series of conversations for various groups to interact with both presenters and peers, and recordings of those are available on our website, as you can see on this slide. We also have resources that, that you can find on our website, and uh, we hope that these will be useful to you. As I mentioned, Denise Sulzbeck and I co-facilitate this learning community. Uh, we hold it monthly, and it's designed to support leaders and systems of care, so that could be states, communities, tribes, territories, and it includes those both with and without federal grants, so they're relevant really to all jurisdictions involved in this work. Uh, we design this for leaders in many roles in systems of care. It could be those in director roles as well as leaders in all the various content areas that are involved in system of care implementation. And we try to be responsive to your needs and to address topics that are important and helpful to you, uh, many of which you've suggested to us. We do like uh, these sessions to be as interactive as absolutely possible, even with large groups like today's. Uh, so we encourage you to put all of your comments, your questions, your insights in the chat box throughout the session, uh, and the presenter may be asking you to do that at various junctions, uh, at various junctures in the presentation. We've also incorporated time for questions and answers. Uh, we'll do our best to address as many of the questions as you enter into the chat box as we can. Uh, at the end of the webinar, there'll be a link in the chat box to complete a brief evaluation survey. And we very much appreciate it your, if you could take just a few moments uh, to complete that before you log out. You'll also receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording uh, of this webinar and the PowerPoint presentation. I'd also like to take a moment to mention our learning management system called Ideas at the Institutes. This is a platform that allows our learning communities to be more user-friendly and more interactive. It's a digital hub. You can join learning communities. You can register for webinars. You could find recordings of previous webinars and resources. And there's a link to sign up uh, for the LMS on this slide. Uh, and also, you can see on this slide what you will see when you sign in. Uh, there's a link for the TA network. Uh, you'll see a catalog of all of the learning communities. And there's also a, an image of what you'll see around the System of Care Leadership Learning Community, where you can access all of the resources that we offer, and of course, as well as those uh, in our other learning communities. So again, today's session is the second of a three-part series on leadership in the time of COVID and beyond. Uh, we created this series in response to the many challenges that we heard from you, uh, ranging from how to lead, how to support your teams, how you can take care of yourself in such a stressful context. Uh, the first one was held in May on adaptive leadership, and you can see that the recording is available uh, through the link on this slide. Uh, this session, of course, today's will provide you with considerations and strategies for leading remote teams, a topic that is very important 
given that now about 70 million Americans are working remotely and uh, nearly all of our work is virtual. Uh, the third in this series is scheduled for July 22nd. Uh, it will tackle personal self-awareness of leadership energy and strategies for increasing your leadership energy. And also on July 15th, uh, we're offering a session on considerations for serving youth with co-occurring developmental disabilities and mental health challenges. So we hope you'll put all of these July dates on your calendar and join us uh, for those. There will be a link in the chat box to register uh, for those events and also you, in your follow-up email, you'll receive the links to register for the subsequent sessions. And as always, you can find information on that uh, in our weekly TA Telegram. So, uh, leading a remote team through and beyond the current Christ COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, we're very fortunate to have an outstanding presenter uh, for this series, Ellen Kagan. She's been a pioneer on leadership and systems serving youth and their families, and many of you may be familiar with her work. Uh, she's founder and director of the leadership program at the Georgetown University Center for Child and Human Development, and led many of Georgetown's well-known leadership academies. And parenthetically, I had the pleasure of working with Ellen at Georgetown for many, many years, too many to mention. Uh, she's also a founding partner of the Coach Approach Partners and president of Georgetown Leadership Associates. I'd like to thank Ellen for her great work in putting this series together. The session will cover the current work environment and beyond, challenges and resulting leadership imperatives, and leadership tactics, how you can lead more effectively in this context. And so now I'm going to turn this over to Ellen, uh, who will get us started. Okay. The, the COVID-19 um, was it emerging quickly, and now we've been in it for a while. So we're going to be talking about ourselves as adaptive beings and how we've learned to cope with all of this and really do some observation about how our teams are doing and how the people surrounding our work is doing. It's a beautiful uh, sunny day where I am in the summer. Um, I hope all of you are staying safe and well and healthy and everyone doing their part to not only take care of yourselves physically, but to work also on your emotional uh, well-being as well. So Beth mentioned um, this whole idea about um, 70 million people out um, now working from home. And I want to kind of set the context for this um, because I'm not sure we're going to go back the way we always thought we were going to go back. And I think as leaders, I just want to set this up to really um, begin thinking about the future. And for those of you who have studied with me throughout these many years in the context of leadership, we really understand that leaders not only live in today, but we also live into the future. Now, the last time we were together in May, I shared with you an acronym that I want to put back out on our table um, because it really does, in essence, describe not only the environment that we're in, but I don't know about you, but in the, the many years I've been in this field, it's never really been a calm, smooth type of field. This is kind of a field that invites um, interesting intersections and building new relationships and delving into the unknown and Beth also used the word pioneer, and I feel like we're kind of still in that pioneering phase in systems of care, really beginning to kind of build that sustainability, but still finding ourselves that the world is still a little volatile, um, a little uncertain, very complex, meaning there's no one easy answer to solve the challenges that we're facing, and ambiguous, meaning it's not clear. We don't actually know um, what the next piece is going to be. So looking at systems of care in general as kind of a VUCA-centric type of environment, um, and you layer COVID-19 on top of that, and the growing awareness 
or the absolute um, imperative around racial injustice, we are in probably a, a, a moment in history that we're going to look back on and our grandchildren are going to ask us where we were and what we did and how we faced this moment. So nothing like a little bit of pressure um, on all of us leaders today. Um, this webinar is going to focus on this notion of remoteness and how we as leaders project our interests and our energies towards the people who we're responsible for, for the people that we work with, so that everybody can be their best selves and so that everyone can succeed. I want to also remind everyone from our first webinar that the framework for leadership that uh, I'm going to be promoting here is that you lead from any chair. You may be a supervisor, you may be a manager, you may be a director, you may be a direct service worker, you may be a teacher, a nurse, um, any part of this, family peers, youth peers, you're all leaders. So when I speak to you as leaders, I'm really addressing everyone. I also will be at times referring to people who are more in a supervisory relationship to, and I'm going to say their people. So find where your space is in, in that framework. So before COVID-19, remote work was um, a sort of kind of maybe thing that some people did. And we're now into the, the 70 million mark for sure. And this is not easy. This is clearly something that is brand new. And as you can see, for all of you who have children, you know that not only are schools closed, but summer programs are, are closed. And there's a lot to be anxious about. And interestingly, a lot to be anxious about, human beings are kind of built for wanting calm, predictability, structure. I know what my day is looking like. And we are in this space where we are not really clear about much of where we're, of where we're going. 75% indicate um, that habits and routines have been impacted negatively. 82% of parents indicate working from home is more distracting to their work. And 80% of employers wish their 80% uh, of employees wish their employer did more to help manage the stress outbreak. So this may look like you um, and some of you may be feeling like when will this end and of course the answer to that question is I don't know. We don't know and nobody knows and that's what's creating this this sense of VUCA. So remote work is, um, as I mentioned before, was on the rise, things were already happening and what's happening now. And you can see from some of these statistics, which I pulled from um, a, a journal called Fast Company, which is in the, the business sector, um, many of us were already working remotely um, as, uh, before COVID-19. Um, the percentage of people is rising, um, was rising exponentially, and 74% of CFOs that were surveyed in this one survey I saw plan to continue some remote work into the future. And interestingly, for, for, for interestingly, meaning the employees and the employers may be on the same page here, 59% of people, um, of employees are actually saying they would prefer to stay in a remote situation after, afterwards. So remote work may be here to stay. And um, here you have on the right-hand side from this study out of the uh, journal Fast Company is that it's going to reduce costs. We're actually learning we can build communication systems that are effective. Um, we're really also seeing that productivity can perhaps stay at a consistent level and more and more agencies and companies, as we know, are investing heavily in remote work technology. Um, for those of you who are in organizations um, that have already invested, we were lucky that we had this and for many of us in the last four months, um, the rate of growth and learning and change has been um, completely exponential. Now, even given this situation, um, 
team members, employees may be feeling certain kinds of things. And I wanted to put this out there because as leaders, this is what we need to be focusing on is where are our team members? Like, how are they doing? We actually care about this because we know that the more we care about our teams and our colleagues, the greater chance for success for everybody, not only everybody's well-being, but actually the goals and objectives that we're setting for ourselves. So here is where I want to sort of, instead of this sort of um, amorphous, we're not feeling good, let's break it down a little bit and what are um, our employees and our team members feeling. So we know that boundaries have completely been decimated. It's been so delightful in many ways to hear dogs barking in the background, to know that children are playing um, on the floor next door to your colleague. You never even knew they had children. Um, and it's been delightful also, we've been sort of in this space where we're actually seeing people's homes, we're kind of getting a sense of a little bit broader view, but at the same time, um, we've moved into personal space. And many employees are really struggling with this blurred boundarylessness um, between work and home. And they're feeling this sense of, I don't know where my work starts and where my work stops. We're gonna talk about that some more in a minute. Um, We've also come to understand that um, people, even though we have technology, are feeling disconnected. Um, we're being separated from ways in which we have influence on people and we have these dialogues with people and the whole atmosphere is different and, and we're not even sure we're getting all the information because if you're like me, and I've heard this from many of you, sometimes the best information that we get about like what's really going on is in the hallways, you know, at the break room. Um, and these informal networks are actually not in play anymore. Many of our team members are confused um, still um, because we are in this space of normal ways of the disruption and the stress that folks are feeling, as you all know, um, not only is there stress because of COVID-19 and the, and the virus out there, but there's also the stress about, am I being productive? Am I being productive enough? How do I demonstrate my productivity to make sure that my boss doesn't think I'm like sitting around and watching Netflix all day? And so we may never have had to do that before because we were seen in our offices. Um, and now we're wondering what our bosses are thinking about us. And lastly, of course, there's the idea that our employees are feeling distraught, um, sad and anxious in response to a bleak situation. And I feel so blessed to be in a field where we actually can sense the difference between something we do as part of our normal workday and when we need to refer someone to um, obtain deeper um, support for that feeling of being uh, distraught. So the questions today that we're asking, like how do we cope, how do we manage, how do we lead, and in many cases our organizations helped us with this very quickly in what I would call the technical work. Um, which is making sure we have the tools to communicate. And so you can see there's all sorts of amazing things. I keep wondering, like, what would we do if we were not in an age of technology? Um, and so this idea of collaboration and messaging, video conferencing, like what we're doing now just would not have been possible even perhaps 10 years ago. Project management tools, document storage tools where we can share things with each other. And, you know, who had ever heard of Zoom? you know, six months ago, and now it's becoming sort of the, the way, it's a verb almost, it's to Zoom, I Zoom, you Zoom, he Zooms. Um, and so it's really interesting to see this. So we've got the tools. So what's missing? So the big point of this conversation we're about to have is on, we've got the tools, is on focused execution. How do we execute on our plans of moving the systems of care forward in this really VUCA chaotic environment? How do we make sure that we have strategic clarity, leadership alignment, connection to our purpose, and focused action? And that's what we're gonna be focusing um, on for the rest of our time together. So I had the pleasure of reviewing the chat um, from our last webinar. And at that time, I asked you 
what was challenging for you. Um, and there's going to be a poll coming. So I um, want you to pay attention. You're going to be asked to pick one of these that's your top, um, your top one, the one that's challenging you the most. But thank you to all of the, the leaders on the call who shared with me what's really going on in your, in your communities. So the first one is ensuring alignment. And for those of you who, would work, who work with me, know that alignment is probably my number one word that I use. Um, I can see where things really break down when people are not starting together. And there was some concern in the, in the chat that people are prioritizing on their own, and we're not really sure what is the most important thing. The second is this idea of helping people keep things on track without micromanaging them. Like, how do I do this when I don't see them, when I don't have my regular um, engagements? Um, respecting work arrangements and boundaries and all the multiple distinctions um, that people are creating for themselves. Keeping the pulse on what my people are doing. Um, how do I know when they need me? How do I know if they need me? Um, it's not like they can just walk down the hall and poke their head into your office. Um, so this idea of keeping the pulse. Maintaining a sense of connectedness with team members is seem to be a sense of, of struggle for some of you. Um, staying in touch with people um, and people saying that virtual just isn't the same. I don't have the same um, high touch. You're a high touch person. I don't have the same connection with people and can't stay in touch with them. Um, communicating without needing. Meaning, how do, I, how do I have this uh, way of communicating with people when I'm not necessarily meeting with them on a regular basis? Some of you mentioned messaging overload, meaning, oh my gosh, we're not face-to-face, -face, and so we're using technology so much that we're actually finding that it's almost too much. Um, there was a big question, particularly at the end of our call, about how do I communicate up the chain and making sure that my superiors, my bosses, know that progress is being made. Um, and this whole idea about how do I give people hope and assurance, yet be real. So these were some of the things I pulled from the, from the, um, from the chat box. And now we're going to go into a poll, Michelle, if you'll help out here um, for folks. You'll see the poll. So if you would consider which is your top challenge in your, from your perspective for you um, in this remote work environment. And we'll keep the chat up for about 30 seconds. We've got another like 10 seconds to go, so we quickly. Okay, it looks like we've run out of time. I am not seeing the results of the poll. So if one of my colleagues, oh, there we are. Okay, great. All right, we've got no answer. Interesting for many of you. And for others, we can see that keeping things on track, keeping the pulse of my team, and maintaining you know, a sense of connection and I also see what I have also heard from many people is this concept of message overload. All right, so, you, so let's just hang on to those thoughts because I'm hoping that some things in this webinar will also be able to address some of these greater challenges. So we aren't the first, the United States um, is not the first um, to be looking at how we have um, thought about this work um, going before us. Uh, this is from a McKinsey document, a practice director from um, McKinsey who is in China. And there are 200 million remote workers. Um, and what did the Chinese companies learn? And you can see um, on the right-hand side the eight lessons that they kind of set out. Um, and we're going to touch on almost all of these. Designing an effective structure, setting direction and accountability, instilling a caring culture, which we're going to talk about, uh, finding new routines, supercharging ways of communicating, harnessing the power of technology, taking security seriously, which I am not going to discuss on this webinar, um, and adopt a test and learn mentality. Um, and because we are in adaptive work, everything is about learning. So if our job is strategic execution, 
and leadership execution. Then I've broken down the three biggest areas which I believe that leaders need to focus on. We need to insist on strategic clarity, facilitate focused action, and strengthen connection and alignment. Now, I've been working with system of care leaders, as Beth mentioned, for 25, 30 years. And one of the things that was really interesting in the um, early days of system of care work is I really believed that process was the most important thing. And then as we got into it, I thought, no, 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 strategy is the most important thing. And then, no, 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 the last thing was, it's all about relationships and leadership development. And no, 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 that's not the only thing. It's really when you package all three of these together, do you actually get the secret sauce. I'm going to talk about insisting on strategic clarity first, and I want to really bring it down, 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 because I'm going to get so granular about this. We're going to be talking about this from week to week to week. Um, but even if you knew what were the right things to focus on and had real alignment and real clarity, without you as the leader facilitating focused action, all those right things would kind of just lay fallow. So it needs you as the igniter, as the facilitator, to absolutely keep things going. It's really in your wheelhouse to do that. And then lastly, in this strength and connection and alignment, you are the glue. You are the glue. If your people are feeling, or if you're feeling like disconnected from what's to your right or what's to your left or what's happening out there, we need to actually begin to find places and spaces where we can strengthen connection and alignment. All right. So we'll first start with this idea of assisting in strategic clarity. Now, I want to say I think our whole field could, could use a little supercharge in this area because a lot of things can be fuzzy. And in leadership and in time of COVID, the fuzziness actually only creates perhaps more unsettledness. And so the leadership imperative is to really be sure at any given moment, you and your team members are really clear on what the immediate priority focus is for every single week. Every single week. And that's really what we're going to be driving for. What it means is, first of all, appreciating it yourself. And I know this work is overwork. Um, and there are way too many things on all of our plates for any one given day. But the thing that I've come to learn is that if we're going to really get to the end goal, we have to prioritize every single week for ourselves and to help your team appreciate that strategic clarity is mission critical. Mission critical. And then, of course, aligning your people on the current priority focus areas. Um, in the best of times, clarity is difficult, as I said, um, and remember, we're in adaptive work, so I really understand there's going to be this kind of like people seeing it from different perspectives, but again, going back to your role as a leader in adaptive work, it's alignment, 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 and um, this remote time really forces us uh, to focus on this alignment even more. I want to also share with you um, something that's called the Pareto Principle or the 80-20 rule. And what this basically says is that 20% of the things we focus on create 80% of the value for your organization. And it matters that we get crystal clear on that 20% because it's so easy to spend our time on the other 80%, which isn't going to give us the focus that we, that we need. So here's what it looks like. I mean, if you wanted to sort of, I wanted to put out an example for you. So <clears throat> if you look at your calendar in any given week, an example might be, I have, my three focus areas are making sure I have office hours for my team, making sure that I'm working on translating my trauma-informed training to online, which used to be face-to-face, -to -face, 
and I need to actually focus on planning for fiscal year 21 because it's around the corner and I've got to start that process. And so the second thing you need to do is clarity about the amount of time you think you need in order to do this in any given week. And it's an estimate and it changes. Um, but we're going to really encourage this idea of actually beginning to put level of effort. This is leadership effort, not level of effort for your team. I know you do this for grants, but it's not often that we do it for ourselves. Um, about how much time you think it's going to take and how much time you need to do. And then clarity on what your calendar looks like. So very often we will have, oh, by October 1st, I have to have my new grant application in or my, my program proposal in. But this is the opportunity to really learn what the Japanese taught us back in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, which is taking a really big project and breaking it down into really teeny tiny little steps so that every single week you are working on what's in the big picture. It's time to really spend time with our calendar. And now with technology, we have so much opportunity um, to use our calendar in a very, very strategic way. So in addition to focusing our own actions um, on our strategic priorities, we also have to refocus our team's, our team's actions on daily um, priorities. And here I have like two completely different examples from two di completely different types of fields. Um, one is um, Nick Saban, who I believe is the coach for the University of Alabama. And one of the things he used to say, which people have really taken to, is that you can't worry about the end result. What really you have to worry about is what happens in every play. Because if you do every play right, you will get to your goal. Um, and he used to say you can't really control the end result, just like we can't control COVID-19 and when we're going back to work and what work is going to look like. It's not in our control. But if we focus on something that happens every day and every week, we actually will find ourselves making progress. And the second person, and this is someone I knew personally and I know personally, um, was a human, is a human rights activist, a gentleman by the name of Natan Sharansky. And he spent time in a Siberian prison camp. He was a human rights activist in the 70s um, and 80s. Um, and he said, don't build future plans on the hope that in the next few weeks or the next few months, it will all be finished. And in his case, it was being in solitary confinement. And he said, it doesn't depend on you. You don't know when you're going to get out of this. We don't know when the pandemic is going to end. And he said, try to build plans which are totally dependent upon you, are totally dependent upon you. He was such, such a brilliant person because he lived for so long with this uncertainty, but he found he could create certainty by focusing his mind on the things that he could control. So you have to coach your people on this distinction between the things that we don't know and we can't control or the things that we can control. And so here, if we're sort of really looking at the, the goals on this chart, the goals are like the scoreboard. And this is kind of where we're going. And remember, I keep saying leaders live into the future, so I'm kind of contradicting myself because now I want leaders to live in the present. Because focus, focus, focus. You'll recognize this term from our work in adaptive leadership together. One of the main purposes of a leader in adaptive work is to help your team maintain focus on what has to be solved today. What has to happen now? And the focus will change week by week, month by month, as you solve the problems, as you move through um, the work that you're doing. But the goals will basically stay the same. And here, this is also really important because the other conversation I would love to, you to consider and invite you to consider having with your people is a conversation about expectations. Um, and again, I think I'm not quite sure where each of you are in this COVID-19 um, roller coaster we're in, but certainly in the beginning, 
Um, and now I think people are getting a, maybe a little more used to it, but they're still asking the question, when? When? And there are a few simple things you can do to maintain an effective relationship in this moment, but it's more important um, that we set the expectations um, with our people about what it means to be working in this time. So part of it is expectations about when will this be over. A part of it is expectations about how are we going to be the most, the most effective, highest performing team even during the time of COVID. Remember, I said to you, what are they going to be saying about you years from now and how you did in this time and in this Space. It is the single most important conversation we need to have with our people. So we're going to align on the current high value focus areas um, and we're going to agree on time and budget and we're going to actually, as we move through this, really make sure that we delegate, delete, or delay um, anything that may not be among the top priority and repeat more often than normal. So rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. It's like the wash cycle. This is how it's got to go if we're going to actually get to the space we need to. All right, we've got strategic clarity. Everybody's clear. You've got your top three, you've got your focus, your people are on board, and now they need you to facilitate this focused action. Because It won't necessarily happen without that. So why might it not happen? Because of something called completion bias. So we have a very, very strong completion bias, humans do. So we'll have this whole idea of prioritizing all the tiny little things that are on our list just so we can cross it off our list. Um, I'll speak for myself. Sometimes I would e even write in, you know, brush your teeth. Good, cross that off the list. Eat breakfast, cross it off the list, make coffee. Um, all those small and significant tasks um, will be on our list, but that huge task that you were supposed to have done a long time ago uh, that keeps getting pushed off will continue to be um, pushed off. And with blurred boundaries, um, this is even harder to do. So the leadership imperative is to help our people focus and follow through by getting distractions and obstacles out of our way. And again, I want to come back to this notion of time blocking. Now remember, in insisting on strategic clarity, I suggested that we have our calendar be our friend. So for those of you who are not using um, technology for your calendars, this might be an opportunity for you to look into it. Time blocking is a strategy that actually puts time on your calendar to do the things you need to do, even though you may not be in a meeting, or you may not be in a conversation, or you might not be in a webinar that you can um, click on and it goes and it saves it on your calendar. The second thing is to keep your finger on the pulse of your people. We're going to talk about how we do that in a minute and establish and respect new boundaries and new routines. So facilitating focus action means you've got to jump in and really be with your people. So here's this picture of a, uh, a calendar, it just gives you a sense of how things are, get time blocked on your calendar. And um, I don't know if you're like me, but I'll put this out there for your consideration. If it's not on my calendar, it may never happen. Um, because most of us are, are so busy during the week that if it's not on our calendar, it may fall off of our radar screen. So beyond time blocking, we want to also make sure that we are really connected to our people. And in this PowerPoint, you'll see three, uh, you'll see four bullets. Um, but the top three, you could actually kind of pick one that, that may fit your, um, your style better. Um, one is message people daily and ask them how they're doing. Um, this could be as, you know, quick as, you know, a three-second little email um, or a text, however your, whatever your culture is, um, but staying in touch with people so that you know how their well-being is doing. You could hold office hours where team members can raise issues with you. 
Um, and I have found this to be a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, tool as a leader so that I am available for my team. Um, they can contact me during those hours and they know that they don't have to schedule because I am free um, and I am available to them. Um, or you can organize a daily virtual stand-up meeting for like 15 minutes. Um, I'm working with one executive director of an organization and um, she started doing this right at the beginning of COVID-19 and reports that as of like the end of, like middle of May, her team was tighter and closer than it had ever been and they were communicating even more effectively um, and more transparently and more authentically about the projects that they were working on simply by having a virtual stand-up meeting every morning for 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, so if you're not doing these things, if these are kind of not routine practices um, of yours at the moment, I'm going to encourage you to really reflect and say, am I in touch with my people as much as I need to be? Or am I letting this just sort of go? Um, and how intentional do I need to be as I move into, you know, this, these months uh, and months of this uh, pandemic continuing? Now, from all this communication from the first three bullet points, you're going to be learning a lot. You're going to be learning a lot, and that's the beauty of connection. Because it's not only just to solve a problem, it's to assess what are the upcoming challenges that I need to be thinking about. What's just over the horizon that needs to be on my radar screen so that I can begin to plan for it? So if you're in touch with people, you're going to be receiving all this information and your job is to sort of synthesize it and create some insights for yourself um, to make sure that your team is moving in the right direction and what's just over the horizon. Now, the way in which this is going to be the most effective is if we help our people and yourself actually maintain these boundaries, as I was just sort of talking about before, this whole idea that my home is my work and my work is my home and everything is like... Like, it's, it's all one, and how do I do this? Okay, first thing I want to say, leaders, you have choice. You always have a choice. You always have a moment when you feel like this is just too much. The question should be, what am I going to do, and what can I do? And so here is a, a tip sheet um, for you, and in a moment we're going to have another poll about daily micro habits and routines that can help us maintain these boundaries so that we really are clear when we are in work and need to be in focused action and when we are in our, our, our safe space of our, of our non-work life. Okay, so here's this list. I won't, I'm not going to read it out loud, but what I am going to tell you is from the moment this pandemic began, the one thing I did was I actually got up every day I made my bed, I changed my clothes, I even put on a little makeup, and the most important thing, and this is going to sound really, I'm being very vulnerable here, putting on perfume, even though nobody was going to be um, smelling it except me all day, was actually what got me in the frame of my work. Um, and I'm going to encourage you that these little tiny micro habits can actually change your psychology. It can make you actually feel like you're working as opposed to um, having totally no boundaries. So you can see there's a whole bunch of little ideas here and we're gonna do this poll now, the second poll, um, because we wanna sort of have you think about micro habits and to pick one daily micro habit that you're not already doing, which you would consider implementing into your daily life one that you're not doing already. I used to tell my students at Georgetown that they couldn't come to class in their pajamas. which might sound really mean-spirited, but they actually appreciated it. So it was good feedback for me.
All right, it looks like the poll has ended. Let's see what we have. All right, take real lunch breaks. Right, for many of us, we probably weren't even doing that prior to COVID-19. Um, and assigning time slots, that's fantastic. Good, and eating your meals in a different room. Right, so we see that, that food is really an important component. And I wanna tell you this incorporating bursts of movement. This is actually, um, interestingly, research-based now. For those of you that are in exercise routines, I wanna encourage you, if you're doing this, to actually take 67 bursts of energy, even in the middle of your exercise routines. It actually shows it gives you um, much longer energy uh, sustainability, as, and we'll talk about that on my next on the next webinar. But also, um, it it uh, supercharges your calorie count. So it's uh, all of this is evidence based. So helping your teams maintain these boundaries is um, really also, in terms of facilitating action, very, very important. Um, and I wanna say to all of you leaders who are extremely proactive in your work and you love your work and we love what we're doing, um, to really be very mindful of your own behavior and be very careful that you are also setting the tone for what you want your employees to do. And I culled the literature and I came up especially with this example of after hours emails because I know many of us are guilty of this, of this type of work. In five different studies involving more than 2,000 working adults, senders of after hours work emails underestimate how compelled their receivers feel to respond right away even when such emails are not urgent. So even though we know it's not that urgent, the people we're sending it to feel as if it's extremely urgent and um, may actually be working against us in this whole idea of maintaining boundaries. All right, so what I'd like you to do now is um, look around uh, your physical space right now. I'm assuming most of you are in, um, in, uh, um, in your uh, workspace. Um, and let's just see, these were sort of my ideas here. What's one thing you would commit to doing that would create a more conducive working environment for you? Let's talk about just your physical space for a moment. What would you do? And I'm going to try to get rid of the poll so that I can see the chat. Mm. Oh, get snacks out of sight. That is so funny. That's great. Yeah. Great. Better chair. Better chair. A plant. More comfortable temperature. Getting our kids back to daycare. That's awesome. Yeah. Declutter. Yeah. It was really, it's really been shown even when you move the clutter out of the way, it actually, it actually helps your, your brain sort of um, calm down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, build a room divider, get a better chair, right? So these are things, you know, as you think about them, um, is again, going back to this idea that you have choice. Like, we don't wanna be victims to, to, this, to this pandemic. Um, and we want to believe that even though it's operating out there, we have some control in, in here, inside of, inside of us. So here's other ideas around physical space. So uh, for those of you who, um, who want to just take a quick look, um, adjust the lighting, light a candle, turn on music, clear the clutter, good. Um, Place an inspirational quote on the wall. Have healthy snacks within reach. So for those of you who are going to put snacks out of reach, put healthy snacks within reach. And these are literally all things you can do. And interestingly, in the leadership literature, and we've talked about this before in webinars past, it's this matter of leaders actually taking action to create a different future. So when we think about 
what we're going to do. And this isn't just a question for you. The reason I'm putting this out here for you is because this is the conversation you need to have with your team. Like, what is your team members doing? And how can you do this together to support each other? Um, and what can you do together? Um, and what will be the new norms? Will you have these stand-up meetings? Will you each person declutter? Or will each person do what they need to do? And how are you holding each other accountable? So everybody feels like we can actually have a space for focused action. And interestingly, um, again, going back to the McKinsey China director, he was working with a company called Alibaba. They chose uh, to run tighter meetings. And in their case, the team decided to really track the amount of time that they spend in meetings um, and capturing the outcomes of those meetings and providing feedback on how the meetings went. That was how they shifted their daily routine in the time of COVID so that they could be more effective. And so the lesson here for us as leaders, this isn't just a conversation for a webinar. This is a conversation that each of us should put on our to-do list to bring back to our teams to say, hey, if our job is to facilitate focused action and there's all this opportunity to increase our ability to focus, what are we gonna do differently? What are, are our new working norms going to be? Very, very easy to forget about this and to assume it's not all that important. And I'm, gonna, I'm here to share with you that insisting on strategic clarity and facilitating focused action are the foundations. And then the third piece, of course, is strengthening connection and alignment um, for all the teams to be working on things together. So people are feeling disconnected, as we said. Now, lastly, we're going to talk about how do we put this all back together intentionally. So a couple of things to share. At first, of course, is to remind you that the leadership imperative after insisting on strategic clarity and facilitating focused action is strengthening connection and alignment. Now, I don't know about you, but in some way, I want someone to do this for me so that if I'm feeling disconnected, a piece of my brain might say, you know, hey, my project director or my boss or my funder ought to be X, Y, Z. Very human. It's very human to think that. So I'm going to ask you to make the flip and actually take the responsibility to say, well, if they're not doing it, they may not be behaving leaderly, but even though I don't sit in the boss's chair, I'm going to do it. I'm going to bring people together and strengthen our connection and alignment. And so there are three different strategies you can bank on. The first one is connect positively with your people and often, talk about that, help them to see the big picture, how what they're doing connects with the big project and to give them, uh, to give them hope, um, and, but to do it uh, realistically. So when asked, what's the secret of the most admired and respected leaders? The answer is, they're using conversations, simple, everyday conversations, to enlist support and get the people around them involved in creating a fundamentally new future. So the, the point of this, it, my, my colleagues here, is that extraordinary times like these call for exponentially increasing conversations. I'm going to say that again. Extraordinary times like these really require exponentially increasing the number and frequency of conversations that we're having. And as I said earlier, those conversations need to be positive, and that positive mindset, of course, starts with each of us as the leaders we are and the leaders we want to be for our people. And not to forget that the power of your own voice on how you're putting out the connections. Are you complaining? Are you frustrated? Are you 
not doing the things that really will lift people up, but basically perhaps um, bring people down. So make sure you're recognizing the power of your own voice. And the internal monologue that you're, uh, that's going on in your head can affect your decisions. So self-talk is a really powerful tool. And in a minute, we're going to talk about shifting from the negative to the positive. If your thinking tends to be on the negative side or the worry side, we're going to start with flipping our thoughts to create energy and possibility, and just to remember that leaders live in the future. So some examples of this, um, and this is a practice um, that you can do as a leader um, on a regular basis, and in most of my coaching, this is probably a significant part of it, is teaching leaders how to make that flip, that reverse view perspective. So the negative thought is, I only walked two days this week, I'll never get into a routine. Two, I walked two days this week. This is great because something is better than nothing. The negative thought, I will never be able to hire the people that I need. Two, I will hire the most important position first. I'm sure I'll find someone from the stack of resumes on my desk. Negative thought, Janice has not returned my call. It must be that she's ignoring me or worse, she doesn't like me or she doesn't want to be a part of my life. Two, Janice must be super busy. I'll try her again today. Another negative thought, Chandra's mother did not show up again. She must not think what I do is important. Two, life with a child with a disability is challenging. I'll find a way to connect that works with her schedule. Now, we do this a lot when we're working with our clients and with the families we serve, and now I'm putting it into the leadership frame. We need to be able to go from the negative to the positive so that everyone feels like we are in a space. So for your consideration and for your homework, or should we ever meet on the street, I'll be able to ask you, were you able to reframe these statements? You know, their standards are not up to mine. Like how often do you hear yourself say this? They don't appreciate what I bring to the table. I've reached out so many times and they just don't respond. They never ask for my opinion. We never seem to be able to come to a decision. Okay, these are real things. I've taken these from the clients that I've served over the last many years. So I know that these are happening um, in our workspace and our job as leaders is to really learn the gentle art of reframing so that we can actually move the, le the, the ledger forward and lead us into the future. Now, this brings me to this last point, which is we as leaders really need to help our teams begin thinking about the future because as Beth said, this is about leading in COVID-19 and beyond. And so what is really out there on the horizon? And we talked about this in our last, in our last web webinar. So, this is an idea of going from the negative to the positive, but we also want to go from the past to the future. And I wanted to share with you a model that I would offer you to begin thinking about. For those of you who've worked with me, you know my number one question is, what did you notice? What are you noticing? So my question would be, do you even have a concept right now about in an hour meeting, how much of your time is spent on the past, how much of your time is spent in the present, and how much of your time is really being spent in the future in the realm of possibility. And so I offer this to you as a framework, as another tool to do an audit, to begin thinking about where would I put my time, where should we be putting our time, where are we putting our time to even know what we should be doing next. Because our job as leaders is to shift the conversation from the past into the present or the future realm and sort of move on. Um, anyone can do this, regardless of authority or political clout, um, and to see how much we can move all of this forward. So if extraordinary times mean we have to exponentially increase our communication with people to increase our connection. Um, these are, again, some tools, some tricks of the trade that, 
that really the field has, has shared have been really, really helpful um, in maintaining meaningful personal connections. We can increase the frequency of one-in-one -on -one check ins We can call or message everyone at least once daily. We can set a consistent, reliable cadence, like having a daily huddle in the morning. Um, empathy and caring are more important now than ever before. And providing positive feedback so people feel hope um, in the future and will be able to flex to different personalities and different needs. Now, for those of you who have studied with me in the coach approach, which we're also going to talk about in the next webinar, you're going to know that there are some core competencies in the way in which we have conversations to make sure that all of this happens. It's both a mindset that this is important and my people are strong and capable and my job is to help them grow and a set of skills that really require us to increase our communication effectiveness so that we can change the conversation. Now this one is my favorite one of all, which is connecting them and helping them see the big picture. This is essential because as we know, everybody's working on different pieces of the big pie. And sitting where you're sitting, for many of you, you see the big pie, you see the big picture, you know where we're going, and we are under communicating where we're going also exponentially, so we've got to increase, increase that. Um, think about this. For those of you who are working, let's say, in the wraparound domain, and everybody's got their sort of piece of the pie, how can you explain to your entire workforce how everything that they do is actually creating a system of care, which is big and visionary and very future oriented. Um, in Pennsylvania, um, where I'm working on really, really um, supporting the PA care partnership to change the conversation, they know and they've done such a good job in saying for every conversation that changes, it changes a relationship, which changes the movement of the system, which actually creates the system of care. It's almost like with every conversation, you see the big picture. And the reason I love this so much is because oftentimes people want to find meaning and purpose in their work. And it feels, again, like everybody's just doing a very, very small piece. I remember once when my daughter came home from her summer internship, she was 15 years old and she was lucky enough to get a um, internship with the National Cancer Institute. And her job was, she was going into genetics and her job was to extract DNA from monkeys. And she was doing this every day. And she would come home and she would share what she was doing. And one day I asked her, I said, Andrea, when someone asks you what you did this summer, what are you going to tell them? And she looked at me and she said, you know, Mom, I could tell them that I actually learned how to extract DNA from monkeys. But what I'm really doing is I'm curing cancer. And I was just so excited for her at such a young age to be able to make the connection between what she's doing and what the end goal is. By having this picture, it really helps us tell a story. And stories are so important in keeping hope alive. As a leader, you are a chief executive storyteller. What you share, what you offer to your people can actually lay the groundwork for some very, very meaningful opportunities, even in this time when we are feeling so incredibly isolated. And this will build the resilience and give people hope, even in the VUCA environment, even when we often wonder what's around the corner. You want to create a space where people feel safe, but that you're also sharing a story of hope for the future. And a deep belief that life is really meaningful, even when and in the midst of something we have no control over. Human beings, just like my friend Natan Sharansky, have an uncanny ability to improvise. 
and make meaning even in the worst of circumstances. And in uh, this Harvard Business Review classic from 2002, they interviewed POWs from the Vietnam War. And what they found was is that the people that survived and survived well and bounced back from the hardship were people who could actually do all three of these. They understood the harsh reality they were under. They had a deep belief that life is meaningful and they had an uncanny ability to improvise their moments. So we have spent some time together today talking about three leadership imperatives that will really support the execution during this time of COVID and beyond. We're going to insist on strategic clarity and ensure that 100% of our teams are in alignment about what is the most important thing to be working on this week, the next week, the next week, and the next week. We are going to provide the energy and the momentum to facilitate that focused action, and we are going to be the glue. We are going to make the choices to make sure that everybody stays connected and aligned, and those human networks of connection will be there. I put together, in closing, a, a one sheet that kind of really sort of synthesizes everything we've talked about um, today. Um, in, your, in the conversations and some of the tools and, and checklists um, that can help you into the future. I want to say that we have the power in our minds and in our skills to change the kind of environment that we're in. So is it that we need to really focus on strategic clarity because the truth is our people are really all over the place? I'm all over the place, and I need to get together with my people and say, what's the most important thing? And what is it that we need to focus on? Or is it that I've got some clarity, but I haven't quite figured out yet how to get that energy moving and to provide that focused action for my people? Or maybe it's that people are moving, but we're not really feeling connected, and there isn't the glue, and the processes and structures and tools aren't in place yet to make sure that we're all staying connected. So if you will, again, at the end of this, help me share with each other, reflecting on all these leadership strategies, tools, and frameworks that we've outlined in this webinar and beyond, what leadership action will you do next to strengthen the focused execution with your remote team? And where will that be so that you can actually have the most incredible leadership journey of your life. Thank you, Alan. I'm going to turn on my video too. That was fantastic. We have one question as to where that checklist list list is. Alan, do you mind going back to that slide so folks can see it? All right. Let's see. Yes, right there. Perfect. Thank you so much. So we do have a few questions. Um, both Karen and Mary were commenting on the daily stand-up meetings. And so Karen asked first, can you expand on the stand-up meeting? How do you do it? And then Mary added, um, can these stand-up meetings be too long if they're more than 15 minutes? Yeah, great, great question. So, you know, it, it depends on, let me, let me first say, everything depends on everything. 15 minutes is about the right time. Um, because it gives everybody on the team the opportunity to not only hear, but to share the most important thing. And if you do it daily, you know, in the beginning, you may go a little bit longer because people are not disciplined enough in their speaking. And we haven't actually sort of set the rules of the game about what content comes to a daily huddle. But once you do that, 15 minutes is all you need. And First thing in the morning has been shown, I'm really happy to say, a really, really effective tool, uh, especially in these times of remote um, teamness. Great. Thank you. There is a question also, if we could go back to the slide. Um, sorry, I lost it. Well, I find that question. Let's go to the next one. Um, Lacey Corley asked or made the comment when we we're talking about strategies around decluttering and what we have around us and what we can do. 
she made the comment that she would want to take down some of her bedroom decor and then put up some of her work related I have a loud airplane above me sorry about this she'd want to take down some of her bedroom decor and put some work related things up but she also wants to keep her bedroom as a non work space when she's not working so do you have stress well, that's a good bit, real struggle wow. wow yeah well first of all what's really interesting is I would wonder if you're sitting at your desk what are you looking at you know that's mm -hmm. Sort of that vision and that view in that moment is probably your your space. So, who was that? Who, who asked the question, Denise? That was Lacey. Okay. So, so Lacey, I'm so totally with you. I actually would find that really challenging as well. But you also have to wonder what is it that you're also looking at when you're in the Zoom meeting because it's not only what you're looking at at your desk. It's also what's behind you that may be more important for you to change if you wanted to change one thing that would sort of give you this opportunity to um, have this co-located um, work um, home space. And, and I think you're, you're right to sort of want that really nice balance. And here's what I would really say is test it. See what, you know, put it out there, try it. Um, see if it goes too far or if it just feels just right or not far enough. And you'll know that within a good day or two. And as long as you're not doing something too permanent, um, you can always switch it back. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So I did find the request for the slide. Shelly Downs would like us to go back to the slide that refers to resilient behaviors. Okay. And and while you're doing that, I'm going to ask you to multitask. It's pretty mean of me. Um, mm -hmm. Colleen is asking, she has another follow-up question to the stand-up meeting. She missed what you said about the best time for those meetings. Yeah, the morning. Morning. Great. Great. So then we had another question from Natalie. She said, how would you go about shifting staff to um, utilizing office hours if they've been accustomed to asking questions via email? She has yeah. three supervisors that manage staff on teams, yeah. and so sometimes, you know, responding to email it works totally. Better. All right, great. So we're actually going to be talking about this in the next webinar because what we've learned is that interruptions are the biggest energy killer for leaders. And so, again, we – look, it's like flexibility and structure. Flexibility and structure. So. So everybody has their own tolerance for flexibility and everyone has their own tolerance for structure. I will say that if you designate, if you during those office hours, here's what you could do. You could basically tell your team that you will not be responding to their emails but for these hours. And you time block those hours in your day and your team members will, will know that so they won't be expecting something right away. I often share with leaders that they should have different communication um, tools for different levels of urgency. So like if one of your staff members needs you in the moment, perhaps you'll use text. But if you're doing an email, you could say, I have from one to two in the afternoon and that's when I'm gonna be, I'll be responding to all the morning emails then and I've saved 30 minutes at the end of my day to respond to all the afternoon emails. See how it works. You know, see if you can actually, you know, support your staff to actually encourage you to have focused time for the uh, strategic clarity for your top priorities. That's great. And that was a great, great teaser for our next discussion on July 22nd. And Jennifer asked, can you provide information on how to register? And Sarah and Beth have put that in there, I believe. Okay. It looks like we have the downloaded slides link. And Sarah, if you could also put the registration link for July 22nd in the chat box, that would be great. Ellen, as I was listening to you and I was struggling with um, some of my own thoughts, I was wondering how do, you, how do you get staff to focus on what they can control and what you can control as a leader? Because sometimes that shift is very hard to do. Right. So, Denise, let me make sure I've got, I've got your question. Mm -hmm. um, I 
I think in leadership, the one thing we should all be thinking about is how to increase the critical thinking of everyone. Okay. Okay. So one of the most important um, things I have observed is that when leaders provide all the answers to our people, like it, they're just going to keep coming to us and coming to us and coming to us for the answers. And during COVID, this is the perfect time to actually really put into play what we probably all wish for and believe, which is the sort of cumulative empowerment of everyone's critical thinking. So we have to break a little bit, Denise, I think some of the dependency that people have on their, on their supervisors, let's say, mm -hmm. and begin to really use questions like powerful questions to our people. And I'll tell you what the number one question is. And for those of you on the line who have studied with me in the coach approach, you know what I'm about to say. All you have to do is say, what do you think? Meaning if they come to you with a question and you come back with, what do you think? And then just be quiet. You know, nine times out of 10, um, the kind of responses they're gonna come up with so if they say, for example, I am really having trouble with boundaries, you know, and they are trying to put this on you, like you can solve this. Well, you can't solve the boundary problem for them, right? Denise, we know we can't yeah. solve it for them. We can, we can maybe, I'm encouraging us to solve it for ourselves, of course. But the question we could have is, well, what do you think? What would you like to do? And turn sort of powerlessness into an empowered question or a powerful question that gets them to solve their own problems. So that is very helpful. And, and I'll add and, Gary Blau taught, taught me not to say but, right? Mm -hmm. And oh, often what we're experiencing right now is what we can control and we can't control. Like I confessed in the chat box when you were talking about the negative, I am one of the ones that said, I didn't get to X, Y, and Z today. Instead of looking at, I was able to get through all of this. So how do we help as leaders, how do we help our staff shift the focus to what they can themselves control? Yeah, that's great, Denise. So the first is we have to practice it ourselves, yeah. right? So, <laughs> right? So the first, <laughs> and, and this can sometimes be a little annoying, really. I mean, even <laughs> It's like we want to complain because that's our human, our human nature. It's coming through. And this is the exact sort of epitome of the distinction between being human and being leaderly, humanly and leaderly. So first we have to train ourselves. The second thing we can do, and for those of you who have worked with me, you know I often will do this, is I will sometimes reframe um, what I'm hearing in, in, from the negative past to the future positive. So Denise, if you had said to me on, you know, if we were in a work environment and you said, oh, I, I only got, I didn't get done with, what did you say? I didn't get done with three things on my speaking today. I would say, and Denise, how many things were you able to accomplish today? And how might you address, how might you address the three things that um, are, are, remain on your list? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my questions are pushing you where? To the positive. Yeah, and into the future. Mm -hmm. Like, how yeah. are you going to solve this? Yeah. Um, and again, sort of, I encourage everyone. Uh, I may spend even some more time on on these some of these coach approach type of communication skills on our next chat, our next um, webinar, so that we can really go deeper into them. But first, we have to practice them ourselves, or catch ourselves, or laugh at ourselves. You know, right. oops, there I go, I'm being human again. How how uh, how novel. <laughs> when we're having some great comments in the chat box about strategies to actually help your staff address their own mental health, positive mental health um, and work. So this is great. Keep those coming. Yes. So, Ellen, this discussion led me to my other question. Um, I loved, I love, love, love the slide that talks about effectively delegating, deleting and delaying. But I mean, again, how the what are your how do you do that? All right. What is, what's the magic there? Okay. So, first of all, uh, if you're like me, Denise, 
I have a list that is just way too long. And when I'm begin to, beginning to feel like it is just too much, one of the things that leaders do is that they are constantly getting on the balcony and looking at their own workload. And I offered the tool of delay, delete, and delegate. And there's actually a, a fourth, which is a little more complex. So let me just share it with you since it's on the table. It's called define. Because sometimes some things on my list are so big, but really all my part has to be is a smaller, I just have to redefine what the, what the it is. Um, so we have to sit down with our own work and intentionally stop and look at our list and call into question what can be deleted, what can be delayed, what can be delegated, and what can be redefined. I will also share with you that I would encourage you to do this with your team. Um, and you could actually have a team party where everybody kind of brings their list and everybody helps the other person kind of get on the balcony and look at their list and say what could be delayed, deleted, et cetera, et cetera. So that that way you build your own support group, your own little wraparound team, so to speak, um, as a leader that can support each of you in defining your strategic priorities so that everybody's clear on what the most important things are. That's great. And I just, I'm looking in the chat box. It does not look like we have any other questions. Great. And we thank everybody. As, as you saw from Ellen's um, presentation, we use your, your chat to guide our next discussion. Um, and so we do encourage you, some of you have asked for the link, we do encourage you to join us for the last in this three-part series. Uh, it's going to be on self-awareness of leadership energy, and that's going to be on July 22nd from 2.30 to 4. Beth and I also invite and encourage you to join us for our final um, learning community as a systemic care learning community in July. It's going to be on serving youth with co-occurring de developmental disabilities and mental health. And um, that's not part of the series. It's our, it's our last final um, one as part of our regular offering, and that's going to be on July 15th. And then, as, as always, uh, we want to thank Ellen for being our presenter today. This was outstanding. Uh, I think she left all of us, I know she left all of us, with specific strategies on how you can apply. And thank you to Sarah Warner our, and our tech team. You kept us straight. Thank you to Michelle Boardman for helping us in the chat box and sharing resources and links. And um, thank you to Beth, my partner, in all of this for the past several years. Please join us again. We look forward to seeing all of you. Stay healthy and happy and um, take care of yourself. Thanks all. Great, thanks everybody. Please stay on. You're gonna see a link to provide us some feedback. You're still getting the thanks coming at you there, Ellen. It's so nice. I know, right? And there's the link. If you're still with us, please do click on that link. We really, really do appreciate your feedback.